Welcome to City Cinematheque, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today we begin a five-week series, Soviet Literary Adaptations. What was it like when the Soviet filmmakers took on some of the classics of their own literature from Russia, but also from other countries? Today we're going to be looking at the 1957 production Don Quixote, one of the great classics of Western literature, and this adaptation by Grigory Kosensev is thought to be perhaps the best of all Don Quixote adaptations. We'll be talking about that and a host of other subjects after today's screening. Joining us will be Professor Paul Julian Smith of the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Now take this opportunity to journey with Don Quixote in La Mancha via the Crimea. Welcome back to City Cinematheque. I hope you've enjoyed this opportunity to um, visit with Don Quixote and uh, Sancho Panza uh, as they walk around a place that looks like Spain while they're speaking uh, Russian. Uh, this film was shot in the Crimea and the Ukraine, but it has a really wonderful look to it, and it's a very, very rich adaptation, as every critic has noted for over 50, 50 years. Here today to chat with us about a number of aspects of this is one of my colleagues from within the CUNY uh, system, a distinguished professor, Paul Julian Smith. Uh, his appointment is in the Department of Hispanic and Luso-Brazilian Studies here at the CUNY Graduate uh, Center. Uh, he's a very interesting guest to have because he began as a uh, golden age literary specialist, which certainly includes uh, Cervantes, among many, many other great artists in the Spanish tradition. But in recent years, he's devoted uh, his scholarship to uh, film and television, uh, particularly of Spain and of Latin America, but clearly with an interest in this kind of uh, adaptation. A number of uh, our uh, viewers might have uh, stumbled across his name even more recently because he's now a regular columnist for the uh, journal Film Quarterly. Welcome to City Cinema Tech, Paul. Thanks very much, Jerry. It's very nice to be here. Pleasure, pleasure. So uh, let's, let's just begin with uh, two art forms, but actually not the novel and the film, but actually theater. And, uh, and, and, and this film. Mm. Why do you think uh, that's an important place to, to, to begin for this film? Mm. Well, you probably notice that when the credits play, it's over a sort of theatrical backdrop. Right. And the director, Kaczynskiew, that he began working in avant-garde theater. Um, and both of the main actors, especially the, the star Nikolai Cherkasov, yeah. he was a theater actor himself. Right. Um, and, and the first scene is really theatrical because it's just, it's like us. It's yeah, yeah. people sitting around a table chatting to each other. And, and so I was, I was a bit scared that it would go on like this for 90 minutes. But then quite soon you cut to the exteriors and, um, and it becomes more like a Western because there's a lot of movement and, Absolutely. and this authentic location that really looks like Spain. Absolutely the case, and we even have, I and mean, we go from shots in the film in which we, we really do see people really gathered around a table, not unlike the one mm. we're sitting at now, that is beautifully framed in a kind of tableau manner to mm. echo period paintings, mm. uh, and at the same time we're drawn into it as I think a kind of the painterly space, mm. but also a theatrical space because the, the, uh, for those of our uh, viewers who are uh, addicts of a certain kind of Russian cinema, there is a Russian theatrical acting style mm. that's, going, uh, that's going on here, which has to do with almost this kind of suppressed energy in their bodies, mm. but um, certain rhythms of delivery. Then, as you point out so well, bingo, we're outside and we have uh, urging uh, music and mm. at certain points, uh, for example, during the, 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 the battle scenes, if you can call them battles or mm. dueling, dueling scenes, we'll have a rapidly you know, moving camera mm. uh, following someone charging on a horse mm. that could very well be a John Ford Western of some, uh, mm. uh, of, of, of some kind. Yeah. So there's always there's this kind of modal shifting that's going mm. on in, in, in the film. Yeah, because sometimes it can be very static and then you have an unexpected camera movement. For example, when Don Quixote escapes from his, uh, his house, he's being kind of held captive, 
and, and the camera goes up in a crane shot. Um, and, and, and so there is a kind of an exploitation of all the resources of, of cinema, even within a, a theatrical tr tradition, I think. Yeah. But it's interesting what you say about the visual style, because it is clearly based on Spanish Golden Age painting. And so although the colors look, uh, look a little bit washed out, this is the way that, say, Velasquez painted. Velasquez has a beautiful portrait called Philip the Fourth in gold and I'm sorry in brown and silver. Right. And the brown. I'm not sure about silver, but there's a, certainly a lot of brown and grey in this film, which does correspond to a Spanish palette, really. Well, and, and it's interesting uh, because this is clearly a, a deeply researched mm. film, uh, and research, of course, if you're looking into the visual culture of the past, and the past is pre-photographic, mm. then all of your uh, th that all of your research must be into artifacts themselves, like costumes that may have survived, or mm. their representation, exactly as you've said, in mm. the painting of the period. Because mm. you know, photo photography, we're all sophisticated. We know is not an unmediated view of reality. Mm. But certainly, we always think of painting as mm. even much more mediated, even when it's in a, a realist uh, tr tradition. Mm. It's very interesting where in the second half of the film, right. as in the second half of the novel, uh, all the characters go to a castle and there's a, um, a duke and a duchess. And the duke's costume here is clearly modeled on, on Philip II. Right. Um, and he's wearing a rather austere black, sh a sort of short black cloak. Um, and this comes from El, El Greco, really, uh, that, that kind of visual look. Um, and um, I was interested to, to think that they took so much trouble over the, um, the mise-en-scene, the costume and the, the set design to make it authentic, right. which is not, in a sense, it's not really necessary because this is a book about fantasy and, right. and craziness, really. But they, <laughs> but they take it very seriously. Well, I, I, I must say that if I, can, if I can put it this way, it's the we're Russians doing a classic of Spanish <laughs> literature. Mm. We have to try harder, particularly mm. if we're going to perform this in our language, Russian, mm. So because, because we need every other duck to be in a row about mm. this. And that would include, you know, not only the casting of this actor given his particular talents, mm. but given his particular physical aspects mm. that correspond with the traditional iconography mm. of, of Quixote. Um, mm. And so we not only have those, that camera that's rushing along with someone, but uh, you had already mentioned mm. the landscape shots, mm. the, the shots of that single character of the slender old man uh, mm. with the lance, you know, mm. against a vast uh, thing. Mm. And that's, you know, that draws from several hundred years of iconography. Of, yeah, I mean, um, really, it's based on the Gustave Doré um, uh, engravings, isn't it? Right. That's yeah. the, like the classic. That's Absolutely. really the way we see Don Quixote. But it's, it is fascinating that the very last shot is precisely what you just mentioned of these two figures, sort of instantly recognizable figures, but lost in a huge landscape as if they were going to go on forever. Whereas the book ends with the death. And right. it's a very definitive ending in the novel. Well, let's 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 now talk about the novel in the film mm. just for just for a minute or so. Mm. We're talking about a you know a thousand page novel <laughs> in two uh, in two parts. Um, mm. You know, published over uh, a, a long period of of, uh, of time. I'm holding here, right? You know, uh, uh, the the most recent and highly regarded translation by mm. um, uh, uh, by, by by Grossman. Uh, on this, and this is a big and very, very thick, great classic of mm. uh, of world uh, of world literature. So, how do you think they approached the problems mm. of selection and condensation? Because it's mm. a ninety-minute film from mm. a nine hundred-page novel. Yeah. Well, one interesting thing is that it's not one book; it's two books. As okay. you say, it's written over a long period. Right. So the first volume is sixteen oh five, and the second is sixteen fifteen. And there's a big difference in tone between ah, okay. the two books of the original novel because the first, the first is really a farce. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that they, the most famous scene, the windmill scene, they mm -hmm. put at the very end of the film, which doesn't really make sense because it's right at the beginning of the novel. Right. And it's a typical farcical scene of part one of Don Quixote in which he sees a windmill and thinks it's, thinks it's a giant. 
Whereas in part two, the book becomes much more complex because the characters within the novel have read the first part themselves, people like the Duke and Duchess, right. and so they are deliberately tricking Don Quixote. Right. Um, and I think that's not the case in the film. They don't say, we read, we read about you, we know who you are. We've heard about you. Mm. Yeah. Oh, do they say that? Yeah, mm. no, no, no. well, well there's, there's the, one thing in the plot is that there's the initial encounter mm. with the woman who's the agent, oh, sort yeah. of setting this, setting this up for the Duke and, and, and Duchess, and then that arrives much later. So she's, mm. you know, she's plotting, that, I mean, she knows yeah. who he is and mm. has decided yeah. to then implot him with them and implot mm. them with him. So Don Quixote becomes much more sympathetic in the second half of the novel, as right. I think he does in the second half of the film, because right. there are these horrible people playing tricks on him. And so the comedy is really quite cruel, I think. Right. And it's difficult to know how to take that. For example, there's a scene where this uh, courtier, this beautiful woman in a lovely dress, she pretends to be dead, and she pretends that Don Quixote has killed her because he hasn't corresponded to her love and it's all a trick, and they laugh. But the, the, I mean, the, the funny thing for me is that the, the Duke says, it was all a comedy. And he says it in such a lugubrious <laughs> voice as if he was Dracula. And you think, yeah, who are these people? It's, it's very strange, the tone there. Yeah, um, absolutely. But we have to sympathize with Don Quixote, don't we? There's no... Yeah, but, but the interesting... Other position. You, you now raise this... Uh, 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 this uh, you know this this theme of discussion about mm. Quixote, which is which has you know circulated around the uh, the, the book for uh, you know uh, several hundred years, and that is this relationship between Quixote as a comic character and as a tragic character, mm. or as perhaps the the great tragic comic hero of mm. Western uh, of of Western culture. How well do you think the film handles that? Mm. Well, I think, as, as you know, that in the 17th century, it was just thought to be a funny book. There was right. no doubt it was comic or satiric. Right. And it was really only with the romantics that um, in the, um, really in the 19th century, that there was a, an argument for Don Quixote as a kind of idealistic hero. And um, I think even in Man of La Mancha, the, yeah. the, the musical is a song, The Impossible Dream. Right. So um, this is not a really a possible way of reading the book when it was written. It was not thought of uh, in that way. But in Russia, I think even more so, they have a tradition since the 19th century uh -huh. of seeing Don Quixote as an idealistic hero and in terms of generosity, that he okay. shows his generosity to, to, to the poor, really. And there's Absolutely. A, there's a line in, in the film, which is not in the book, um, uh, which is something like, I, I, I hear... I hear the poor people which the happy do not hear. Uh, and so he puts himself as a, in the position of, as a defender of the poor. For example, right. I mean, the scene of, I mean, it doesn't work out. Right. He, he, <laughs> de <laughs> he defends the, the, um, the little shepherd boy. Right, absolutely. With disastrous results. But the fact that his heart is in the right place is, I think, the important point for that reading of him. Right. No, I think you make this very interesting uh, a point about when anyone anywhere in the world is dealing with one of these big classics. Mm. You're not just dealing frequently directly with it, mm. but what you're dealing with is it plus a history of interpretations that sort of that position the work facing one direction or another. And one of the things that makes this attractive to Russians in the middle of the 20th century is not how it was received in Spain in the 17th century, but how Europeans began to reinterpret it and to see this idealist aspect to it, um, you know, in the 19th century. That, you know, and, and the, the, ide the idealist having this tragic aspect mm. to him as, um, as, as well. And mm. uh, I think you and I were talking about the fact that, that before the Soviet Revolution itself in 1917, there's already in Russian culture through Turgenev, mm. uh, there is discussion of Don Quixote coupled with Hamlet. Mm. which is not something someone would have done mm. in, well, you know, in Spain in the 17th or 18th century, correct? Mm. No, that would be, would have been impossible because <laughs> 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 they didn't know who Shakespeare was. Yeah. Uh, but um, 
And, and then uh, uh, Kaczynskiev, who directed this right. film, Don Quixote, he went on to make a very famous uh, uh, version of Hamlet ten years later in, in the Soviet Union. Right. So the thing about that is that um, so if Don Quixote was introduced into uh, Russia as it was in, right. in the 19th century, it was, as you say, as an idealist hero. And, um, uh, and, and that's how he stayed. And, and he was the inspiration for Dostoevsky's The Idiot, right. the character Mishkin, who is a kind of holy fool. And I think this, this figure of the holy fool is, is important within, within Russian culture before the revolution. And, and here uh, Kaczynskiev seems to be harking back to that in his de noble depiction of Don Quixote. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely the case. So there's a way in which this becomes acceptable, uh, and I'm not, I'm not even talking about Soviets yet, mm. but this is acceptable to a line of, of, of uh, interpretation and, and thought within Russia at mm. the same time, since Russia has at a certain point suffered from its own sense of isolation mm. and disconnection, etc., it's a way of gathering in one of the great classics mm. of Western literature and say, hey, you know, we're part mm. of this tradition as well, because look at this line through, as it were, mm. um, uh, you know, all the way from Don Quixote through Dostoevsky on to the fact that we're capable now of mm. making a world-class film, mm. not merely for our own domestic audience, but clearly this is a, a, a film for export as well. Mm. Yeah, this uh, is, You see this in the case of many repressive regimes. They want to make prestige pictures so they can export, which will help to change the image of the regime abroad. A uh, absolutely, and this, is, uh, this film comes after Stalin's death, Mm. with the period of thaw announced by Nikita Khrushchev. Mm. Uh, and there are more radical films uh, mm. in terms of how they reinterpret more recent history coming just a year or so later, uh, mm. like The Cranes Are Flying, uh, The Ballad, Ballad of a Soldier. But mm. this is really a film that sort of says, hey, you know, we do big budget literary adaptations of quality mm. that that show we're not so different from you mm. uh, in some kind of in some kind of way because you can sit mm. in Kansas City or or Singapore or Cairo or Moscow or mm. London and watch this and we're all because it's a very humanist film in that way. See, yeah. we're, we're all linked by the, linked by this. We're not such bad guys after all. Mm. And I would imagine it's a film that was shown a lot of, at festivals around the world and, and would have uh, gathered prestige for the government through, through that. Um. Absolutely, very, very much the case and mm. received a rave review when, mm. by the New York Times uh, <laughs> when it was originally released here. Mm. And it, it took, it's a very interesting thing, Paul, because it's, it was a kind of filtration process in this high Cold War period that mm. for the Soviets to get something like this to the United States, it would have to go out into an international festival circuit mm. and then sort of be vetted there as mm. part of acceptable international culture, mm. and then American distributors would get interested mm. in it because, of course, given the McCarthy era things that had passed, not very, mm. you know, that was happening in the United States and here just at the end of Stalinism there, nobody wanted to touch anything Russian if it had any mark of propaganda, mm. you know, about it. And this is presumably a propaganda-free uh, adaptation mm. from that particular era. Yeah, uh, Jerry, because it's very difficult to uh, place politically this film. And, uh, and so a few years later, uh, the same director made Hamlet, and that has been read by, at least by modern scholars, as being a critique of the Soviet Union, of, of, of a, a corrupt uh, regime. Uh, and this film, it's, it's difficult to tell because they go to the, uh, the castle and there are these, what, what are clearly decadent aristocrats. Yeah. Right. Uh, they are they are bored with being in power, and and so how do we read this? Is this an attack on the aristocracy in 17th century Europe, or is it possibly a veiled, very veiled attack on the Soviet um, um, aristocracy, the the Politburo that controlled everything? It's 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 not clear. Well, and I think you're making a great point because mm. I think it's very important that it's not clear mm. because, as I've said about certain other works that have this 
potential allegorical dimension to them. Mm. It's very important that certain of these films that have that dimension are deniable allegories. Mm. Mm. So that in certain kinds of allegorical works, you know, if you don't go from level one to level two, then the work is a failure. Mm. You know, because that's the whole point, is that you're supposed to read through level one to level two. But, mm. as, as you put it, in repressive regimes, when mm. you're playing an allegorical game, then the allegory may need to be ambiguated, mm. and it may also need to be, well, what do you mean this was the Politburo? Mm. No, that wasn't the Politburo. That was the decadent Spanish court. Mm. No, 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 no. You're reading allegory where it's not there. Yeah, so the historical film can serve as a kind of alibi for critique well, of the present, which is what happened in Spain during Franco's dictatorship. Well, well, they yeah. did exactly the same thing. Um, but, but one, I mean, if we take that scene at the end, the classic scene right. with the windmills, uh, the dialogue there is, is not in the novel. And Don Quixote says, freedom is worth dying for. And um, actually, I, uh, in, in the Soviet anthem at that time, there was a line uh, which went, I know of no other country where man breathes so freely. Which, <laughs> which we may not agree with that. Right, exactly. But, but, so, yeah. so freedom was invoked within the Soviet Union as being something they were striving for. Uh, but we perhaps viewers watching at that time in the 50s may not have agreed. Right. That, uh, um, and so it's kind of ambiguous. And there's also a line which is the subtitles say, um, Don Quixote says, long live man. Right. But it's actually long live people. And, and so ah. this praise of, of common people uh, would, would go with the official ideology of the Soviet Union. Uh, Absolutely the case. But it, it could be read as being a veiled critique of the regime, I think. Right. Now, one of the other aspects of this as a, you know, a prestige uh, mm. product is actually the kind of way in which the film is made and, and, mm. and, and, and the style. Now, what, what do you make of that, Paul? Mm. I think viewers might be surprised because the, um, if you're familiar with earlier Soviet film, Eisenstein, and this actor was in, uh, he was in um, Eisenstein's uh, Ivan the Terrible. Absolutely. So these are very experimental, dramatic films in, in terms of editing especially. So right. it really jumps out at you that, this is, that these are unusual films. They're not made like a Hollywood film. And this film, in contrast, Don Quixote, is, is very traditionally made. Right. Um, and there are just a few moments which are, are, are kind of strange. And so again, they, they, what, what surprises me is a scene where uh, Don Quixote is um, at sort of attacking these wine skins. Absolutely. And suddenly we see what he sees, which is that they, they take on faces. Uh, and so we see uh, that's a subjective shot. And it's very rare because this is a, a film, although it's about madness and fantasy, which is shot with the purest kind of realism. Abs uh, absolutely, absolutely the case. Or, mm. uh, for, uh, once again, we've talked about this realist attention to the detail of mm. interiors or to these magnificent framings of shots when we have the landscape shots, mm. none of which uh, um, really use the, the power of cinema to use the subjective mm. shot. Mm. And, uh, as you mentioned earlier, the windmill sequence, which is in a certain sense something the audience is waiting for mm. the entire time because you can't make a Don Quixote and not have the windmills mm. uh, in it, is placed at the end. And then we have one of the boldest camera placements of mm. the entire film, which is of, of looking directly at Quixote's face as he is being you know, mm. circulated around and around mm. yeah. on this. So it's a really vertiginous shot, isn't it? And it does make you think of earlier Soviet film where they would put, I don't know, a camera on a train or something, and they were obsessed with mechanical movement. Absolutely. And, 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 and this is 30 years later. They've gone through the avant-garde phase, and it's, it is a culturally conservative time. A absolutely. But what's interesting to me is that this is, since it's one of the most famous tropes of the entire book, the mm, Quixote yeah. and this, that they, that they move it to the end, mm. you know, to have a kind of payoff to the narrative that's a mm. big visual payoff, and that, mm. and that the most avant-garde technique in terms of editing mm. and camera placement is, in a certain sense, the big climax scene yeah. of, the, uh, uh, of the film. Mm. Uh, so the most dramatic scene visually is also the most dramatic um, in the literary sense as well. Um, uh, absolutely. But, but there, actually, there is one other subjective shot right at the end, which is when 
Yeah, he, uh, Don Quixote is dying, and Dulcinea appears Absolutely. to him. And so it's the same actress who plays the, the village girl, but she is transformed in, with a beautiful costume. And, and the ending is really quite different to the novel, because in the novel, Cervantes says, shows us that Don Quixote was mad, and he becomes sane, and he gives up his fantasy. And that's not really the case in the film, because it's rather reconfirmed, because we see Dulcinea, this imaginary damsel, well, appeal that's, to him. That's, mm. that's the idealist impulse towards mm. the future and the better life, oh, which yeah. corresponds perfectly with a Marxist interpretation of where they're mm. heading with mm. their idealist heroes. Mm, because uh, he does talk about the golden age, doesn't he, at the very end? Absolutely. Which is indeed, in, in the novel, there's a long speech about the golden age. Uh, but but, but in, in that case, Don Quixote is referring to the past. He's, right referring to a time when we were all shepherds and uh, I lived a sort of fantasy rural life. You know, Paul, I'm mean, going to hate to do this to you, but mm. our golden age here has come to an end because mm. we've, run, we've run out of time. Mm. If you'd like more information about this particular series on City Cinematheque, Soviet literary adaptations, or generally, if you'd like information about City Cinematheque or the programming at CUNY TV, there's a way to get it. And it's not a big surprise. It's on our website. So visit www.cuny.tv. At our website, you'll find information about full programming at the station, as well as click-ons to communicate with us. And we do like hearing from you. You can also sign up for the mailing list, the e-list, that is, for City, Cinem City Cinematheque. Please visit www.cuny.tv. Paul, a pleasure having you mm. here. A lot to say about this film. I think we mm. touched on some of it, but I think um, you know it'll uh, help people think about this uh, at mm. home. Pleasure having you here. A pleasure being here, Jerry. Great. Thanks so much. And thank you for joining us today as we stroll through the archives of film history. I hope you'll uh, join us again when we take another stroll. In any case, bye-bye for now. <laughs>